Hi, and welcome to the Trail to Austin, the place to get to meet the people of Austin and find out how they became the people of Austin. I'm your host, Bob Morse, and sitting several miles from here on his own version of the Chicken Ranch is Joel McCall. Okay, now what does that mean, Bob? My version of the Chicken Ranch. I actually have chickens. It's, it's not I mean. like you might think. That's what I mean. You have to tend your chickens. Doing well. Good. Yeah. So we thought we'd uh, bring you another informative guest today. And uh, so what we wanted to do was talk a little bit about the real estate market and basically what the pandemic's done to it. And as you know, we're one of the most popular places in the U.S. to move to. And so we thought we'd see what the people look like they're moving here. So with that, I will introduce... Real estate agent, Dave Murray. How are you doing today? Good. And how about you? Great. Great. Beautiful day in Austin. Yeah. About you know. Oh, a yeah. Chamber of <laughs> it really is. You know, anyone who might be visiting Austin today is probably going to want your phone number to move here. You bet. <laughs> Give it away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's... So about a month ago, I'm sure it would have been a little more difficult, but. <laughs> so Dave, let's, let's start off with, uh, where were you raised? Where are you from? Are you a native Austinite? No, I was born in Beaumont, Southeast Texas. For those not familiar with Beaumont, just right up against the Louisiana border nearly. And I'm born and raised, left there at 18. Uh, I couldn't, you know, I don't want to say I couldn't get out of there quick enough, but a month after graduating high school, I got out. Dallas, uh, area, Arlington, actually, year and a half, uh, schooled in California for a little while, then Hawaii for two years, Australia for a little while, then, uh, then to Arizona, where after, uh, seven years and six colleges, I, I graduated from Arizona State, and I took a year off, traveled overseas, and then I ended up in Austin. So that's the uh, long road to Austin. So about what no year kidding. was that? So what brought you What's to that? Austin out of all of these well, travels? You know, actually, what was so funny, I didn't intend to get back to Texas. So after I loved Arizona and, and uh, actually had a job and a, a place to live and everything set for Australia at the end of my travels. And that's where I thought I'd end up. And things happened with a uh, family that I ended up having to come back to Texas. And uh, my father was in the hospital recovering over several months. And as he got better, I started coming up to Austin, visiting friends, and it, it just evolved into moving up here. And I'm glad I did. It's been phenomenal, fantastic. Always enjoyed Austin. We used to, in high school, used to come up to Austin, and it was like – Coming from Beaumont to Austin was like come, coming up to Disneyland. I mean, it was right. like, you know, different. You know, back back then, this is back in the late 70s, Austin was different. It, it had its own little vibe, unique to, I would say, anywhere in the entire country. And it was just different. And it was, you know, for Beaumont, Southeast Texas boy, it was absolutely uh, magic. And uh, still retains a lot of that, although it's grown considerably. So that's, I just ended up. It, it wasn't planned so much as just evolved into uh, coming up. You know, if you got to live in Texas, you want to be in Austin and surrounding hill country. Boy, that's the so truth. <laughs> so so how, long, how long have you been here? Well, mid-80s. I've been here, uh, geez, 35 years plus. All right. I've been, I've been here longer than any, anywhere else. So I definitely still... Uh, Native to Austin because it's been double the time I've been anywhere else. Never decided. Yeah, that's interesting. We, um, one of our early shows, we were talking about, um, the Frost Bank building and when that went up. And I didn't realize that it didn't go up until 2003. And we, you know, so it was probably, um, I moved here in 93. So 10 years, the skyline didn't change. And then the last 17, the, the change in the skyline is just amazing. Well, I've had the last, uh, I've had the last time I saw was somewhere between 25 and 30 new high rises either going up right now or permitted. And these are true high rises. These aren't mid rises. These are big, tall buildings. More, I would say more high rises going up in downtown Austin and 
probably anywhere else in the country. So that's something I wanted to ask you about because, um, you know, we're seeing a trend at least in the Northeast um, and in Chicago and stuff where people are wanting to move out of those type of uh, high rise buildings and stuff like that. And how's that going to bode for Austin if they keep putting more up? Well, they're not all residential, you know, some are office, right. some are residential, some are apartments and, and some are mixed use. So I think there's a, a mix of that. And I think over, over, uh, over time, you know, I think it's going to be good. I mean, I think there's Austin if they, you know, it's a whole other topic about the homeless and, uh, you know, defund the police, which is hurting downtown and Austin in general. So I'm part of campaign Save Austin now to try to clean that up. So without getting too political, that it's definitely there's no question I've, that there's people currently uh, that are living in those high rises that are are leaving and selling to get out of downtown. But overall, over time, uh, hopefully that's a bump in the road and. Uh, we get people in there that have common sense and, and get that cleaned up. And, and downtown Austin's very, uh, desirable and, and thriving. Uh, and uh, over time, I think it's gonna, you know, you're gonna see a huge demand and a lot of empty nesters go there and then the young single people and, and people that are just used to coming out of big cities that want to continue in a, a downtown inner city, uh, you know, urban core atmosphere are going to continue to, uh, I think, live there. So I think, yeah, I think it's all good. I think we just need to get, get it cleaned up a little. Okay. Well, that was kind of a bumpy way to get into the real estate conversation. But since we were talking about the, uh, you know, permitted high rises, I know that was one of the questions at the top of my head was. Well, it does. I mean, it, 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 but it does lead to, you know, people wanting to, you know, the demand for land and ranches and just getting out to the outer areas, dripping and, and, uh, there's been a, a significantly increased demand for, uh, for land ranches and getting out. And, and I think part of it's driven by the pandemic and by some of the things going on politi- politically in Austin. So it's, it's all very impactful for what's happening now. So let's, We'll back up a little bit and go back to um, just Austin real estate in general. Um, you've been here long enough. You've seen the growth, obviously, and how it just keeps growing exponentially. What is driving everybody here? Well, I mean, one, it's the it's you know the natural beauty, the lakes, the rivers, the hills, uh, cost of living for a lot of people coming from. The areas you just mentioned. I mean, the three primary areas people are relocating from, I would say, uh, that I see, uh, are New York in the Northeast, uh, Chicago in the suburbs, and all o- over California. Now, other areas as well, but that's where you see a lot of the higher network individuals relocating from those areas, uh, generally speaking. And, and, uh, I think it's just, you know, again, you don't want to say politics drives everything, but I mean, it's cost of living. It's the business environment. I mean, Texas for now 14 or 15 years in a row has been the number one place to do business in. Austin is one of the top cities to do, uh, you know, relocate to and do business in. So a lot of it's business and cost of living, um, uh, has been driving and the beauty. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's uh, consistently ranks. As one of the top cities in the country for desirability across a lot of different spectrums for be it from quality of life to schools to, you know, weather, uh, but business and cost of living. I mean, it's all impacting people's decision to move here. Yeah. So, uh, the, um, so like as for our coastal people where the cost of living is uh, significantly higher when they move here, what are, are they seeking bigger houses, more acres? What are they looking for? You know, I think so many of them, early on, are, are just amazed by what they're able to buy. But, uh, you know, it's it just so many circumstances are different. And what we do is so differently than what most realtors do. I mean, we do – We it, it's not a master plan I had. I mean, we just evolved into doing a lot of different stuff. And we do land ranches. It's about 50% of our business. Uh, we do some development commercial deals and then we do a lot of residential from just because I have a team that 
that, that agents live in different areas. I mean, we do the suburbs. We do a lot of high and luxury and waterfront. So we see a lot of different buyers on a lot of different spectrums looking for a lot of different stuff. So it's kind of hard for me to, you know, say one particular buyer, but, but it's, uh, you know, there's very affordable housing if you go out in the suburbs, not so much in, in close in Austin now. Yeah, I mean, it's like north, south, east, and west. It's gotten very expensive if you, if you want to stay close in. But, um, you know, I mean, a lot of the schools. So we've got, had a lot of people that have come here that have had their kids in private schools that once they look at the, uh, the school systems here uh, in the school districts, they, they put them in public. And a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them go from private to public here because our schools are some of the best in, in Texas and some of the best. I mean, uh, we moved into West Lake Ains years ago and one of the top rated in the country. So, I mean, that, that's a part of it. And what you can buy compared to these areas they're coming from. Yes. I mean, they're, they're surprised, but I mean, you got good schools going in every direction from Austin. So I think that, that's uh, and you don't have to go spend a lot of money. I mean, you, you know, Round Rock's got good schools. Cedar Park, Leander's got really good schools. Lake Travis, West Lake Dripping. I mean, these are all very good uh, exemplary rated schools, uh, and and across all different price ranges. So I, I wouldn't oh. say there's any one leading uh, area that we have people for us. Others that might zero in and maybe they just work West Austin or West Lake or Lake Travis. I mean, that's different. That, that, you know, we do all those areas, but some others might just work those. So they see a different, you know, reason for people moving, but we see a lot of different reasons and areas. So you, uh, like you've mentioned, you specialize in land and ranches and, uh, I guess larger parcels. What is kind of take a neophyte through the difference between selling a house and selling a range? Well, I think it's easier for people to zero in on what they want residentially on a house, you know, because they're going to have a price range. They're going to have certain criteria. Maybe it's distance to work or might be, you know, schools are more important and, and then distance to work, et cetera. And, you know, it depends. Single, are they single? Or are they married without kids, married with kids? So a lot of that factors in. So I think I relocated early on. So in the early 90s, I, I moved over. I was on my own. I moved over to Cobalt Banker. And and I literally got there just at the right time in the early 90s. Um, Cobalt Banker was number one reload company. And, and that's not who I'm with, by the way. <laughs> longer so I'm not trying to give Total Banker a plug but I was fortunate in the sense that they were number one reload company in and out of Austin and and at the time I moved over there IBM was moving literally hundreds of people to Austin from Poughkeepsie New York uh, from an IBM uh, facility there to here and I literally relocated over 100 IBMers and uh, and so uh I mean, they were all very specific on what they wanted, you know, good schools and great locations at IBM. So, and they were back in that day, they were able to buy really good homes and, and, you know, under 200 up to 300 and a really high end home in the areas they want to be in was like 400. So that was crazy. But that, that, you know, that was very, that was a very specific targeted move. These people would come in for three days. You'd put them in your car, you'd drive them to all these different areas, which were, pretty specific and uh they in you know 90 percent of them buy a house on that three day visit wow. so i've been i've been through that ringer and so that was different people coming down they might not you know a lot of people that have a look it's the internet so a lot of people have identified pretty much what they want when they get here or an area or they talk to someone that's here or they talk to the agent or they've identified an agent kind of a general area so you get a general sense of depending on their budget their circumstances, what they want. I mean, you have some people moving here that are retired and empty nesters. Maybe they're moving here because they want to be near their family and grandkids, et cetera. So that's a difference. You know, that schools aren't a big deal to them. It's more location, price, quality, you know, what, what you know, interests are, golf courses, whatever. So it's, it's just so different, you know, but it's, you just got to take in circumstances. And we've moved 
I, 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 I probably move more reloads here than 99% of agents. I mean, just so many, hundreds, hundreds of, and companies. We've moved whole companies here. So it's, it's just, it's just everything. All, you gotta customize everybody's search. It's all different. So, I mean, we've moved people here that have spent millions on a home, and we've moved people here that have a budget of 200000 So, So what, what would you say is a demographic of your average uh, client that's moving here, you know, age, family? Um, you know, probably uh, a younger couple relocating for business that's probably uh, in their – late thirties, early forties, you know, if I had to do that, but again, because we do so many different things right. so, in so many different areas across so many different types of real estate that it, it's hard to, for me again, to pigeonhole that as opposed to someone that might just do one or two specific areas. But I would say that's your typical chamber of commerce probably has better numbers on that than I do because <laughs> okay. we're different than, than most real estate agents. But I would say, you know, it's someone, you know, his family is probably the thirties to early forties that, and they're coming here. They either they, they're getting relocated by their company or they taking a new position with the company. But most of them are coming here with, you know, that they got a job. Yeah. It's either one of those two. Yeah. Joel told cool. me beforehand that you were, your clientele might be a little different. So, um, what was I? Oh, one of the agents I heard something on the uh, news this morning, she was saying that 40% of her clients are from outside of Texas. What would you guess your percentage is? Well, when you say, well, you mean as far as the reload part of it or 40% of, of all the clients, I would say, I would, I would, gosh, I hadn't thought about that, but I would say right now, I would say, uh, not the majority, but I would say there's a big portion. And it's not, so let me reference, when I say my clients, a lot of the deals we're doing, so we, we're we getting, because we did, we have a pretty good footprint and, and some luxury and, and uh, you know, waterfront and higher end properties. We're, right now we're getting a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but celebrities, CEOs, uh, athletes, you know, we've over the over the years we've dealt with quite a few and uh, have have relocated and not necessarily working with them ourselves, but they bought some of our properties. So they've maybe come through another agent that was the buyer's agent, but we we had the property listed. Um, <clears throat> so I would say, geez, you know, the reload that we personally dealt with is you know twenty percent maybe right now. Okay. Coming from out of state. All right. So along that line, talk about how, about marketing the age of the internet and pandemics and how that, that may have changed over the last few years. Well, so we, you know, it's, we're, we've been way out ahead of most because in the ranch part of the business, we're way, way ahead of 99.9% of anyone on the ranch part of it doing social media, even Google AdWords campaigns. I started that a long time ago. So social media, Google AdWords, uh, we got the largest Instagram account for land ranches in North America because we started it way before everybody else. So, so we, I've not been very big on print advertising for a long time. Because I just, it's just, I just, there's agency value in it. I don't. You can reach so many more people through uh, internet, email campaigns, social media, targeted Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. I mean, there's just so many other ways to reach people. And 90% of everybody doing any kind of search for home, land, whatever, they're doing it on, on the internet. That's how they're finding it. So that's where we spend our time, energy, effort, money. And the pandemic, uh, that hasn't changed. I mean, that's, if anything, that's ticked up, right? So, um, and there, when the pandemic started, there was a lull. Everybody, like, you know, held back. But that didn't, I'm telling you, that lasted maybe a few weeks, 
six weeks maybe, and then it was off to the races. I mean, it's gotten busier uh, across every part of real estate. I mean, I'm talking land, ranches, residential, developers that won't, you know, and people come that are local, but also coming in from out state that are trying to get a footprint in Austin. Everything has increased. I know home sales year over year compared to last year at this time are up probably at least, I think, the last statistic I saw, and that this could be wrong and could be verified somewhere else, but it's up at least 14% over, over what it was last wow. year. So the pandemic has not helped. I mean, not hurt. It's actually, you hate to say it's helped, but it's probably, well, there's no probably about it. The real estate market has gotten better in Austin. Now it's hurt other areas, I'm sure, but in Austin and yeah. it's, it's helped. Yeah, one Nothing day. like a good pandemic, huh, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> hey, whether it's helped or not, I'm about done with this. I'm ready to go back to normal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I heard, too, about that was, um, you know, obviously people are looking to move from areas where they're packed in tightly and, and living together like that. Um, but one of the things that did hurt Austin a little bit, I heard, was the weather. Because they can't spend the time in the restaurants and the bars and the stuff like that, so they want to be outside. So it was actually driving more people to Colorado than to Austin for a change. Well, you mean because the weather's hot in the summer? Oh, yeah, but uh, the weather's nice, nicer there in the summer than here. Well, yeah, a lot of people leave Texas, Colorado in the, in the summer, but I haven't heard that. I don't think the weather. I mean, it depends where you come from, I guess, but I, I'm, mostly I think people are pretty happy with the weather. But, uh, you know, there's no doubt anyone that says it doesn't get hot in Austin in July and August is, uh, you know, I don't know whether <laughs> maybe they're from Arizona, but uh, yeah. I don't mind the heat. I like the heat. And I think when it does get hot, that it's, it's a drier heat. So I think it's more uh, bearable. Um, then where I grew up in Southeast Texas, it gets hot and it's, you know, 90% humidity. And coming from that, I've never been bothered by the heat here. But again, you know, when it does get really hot here, it's a drier heat and I think it's more bearable. But yeah, 80 degrees in July and August in Colorado, pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I have heard that it hurt, it hurt the reload market. I don't think that's impacting the reload market to Austin. I think. Long term, the people that are moving here are, uh, you know, the weather's maybe that's in the top five, but it's not one of the top three reasons people are moving here. Sure. Mm. Okay, so I moved here from Arizona too, Dave, and um, I'm familiar with the dry heat argument, but, you know, a microwave is dry heat also, and you know what that does to a hot dog. (laughs) Yeah. But. I was just in Arizona a weekend before last. It's 105, and I'm telling you, if you're in the shade with a breeze, it does not feel hot. That's, yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought you had a question, Joel. <laughs> that's what I was no, I just want to make a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, 105 is 105. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so they, of course, uh, if, you're, if you're moving from Minnesota, where yeah. it snowed in June, Oh, 105. Okay. Well, you, <laughs> yeah. You appreciate this, Dave. I used to, uh, for one of my jobs, I used to fly from Houston to Denver in the middle of August. If you can imagine that. <laughs> that would have been a refreshing. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, talk about whiplash. Yeah. So, um, Tell us a little bit more about the uh, the type of ranch lands and lakeside things and stuff that you're working with at the moment. Well, I mean, we do a lot of different. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of different kind of properties and, and small ranches. I mean, the kind of our wheelhouse is is uh, we have got a big wheel. We do a lot of different properties. <laughs> If you look on the website, you see a lot of different stuff. And we have two websites, uh, DMTX, which is like Dave Murray, Texas, DMTX.com. That's got everything. And then you go to TexasLand.com, and that's more land ranch oriented. And, 
you know, depending on where you're coming from in the country, a lot of people say, hey, I want to buy a ranch. And I'm like, well, how big? You know, 20 acres. Well, in, in Texas, <laughs> that's not really a ranch. <laughs> but if you come from New York, it's a ranch. <laughs> so, you know, and we do a lot of properties in that, uh, you know, 10 to 20 acres with a nice home on it or, you know, and, and there's a big market for that right now, really big market for, you know, something, you know, uh, in that, you know, 10, 20 acre range with a house in a, you know, not too far out, you know, still convenient to amenities, et cetera. Um, so we've always done a lot of that, but then we do ranches further out. I mean, we got a big ranch that was two to 3,000 acres that, uh, was bought or it's being cut up into, uh, you know, smaller ranchettes, you know, 50, 100, 200, 300 acres. And uh, I think what people got to realize, at least in Texas and probably true in a lot of different areas, is it, almost every neighborhood used to be a ranch. Right. I was thinking about it. Almost every neighborhood used to be a ranch, and almost every ranch used to be a much bigger ranch. And just over generations, they've gotten, you know, whittled down to where now it's difficult to find a big ranch within an hour of Austin. A bigger ranch meaning, you know, a thousand plus acres within an hour of Austin is difficult to find, you know, pub, uh, available on the market. So uh, you got to go further out. But still, you're in Texas where 97% of the land is probably owned. So you don't have to, you know, there's ranches in every direction uh, from from Austin. And, and we've always told people that, and if you make a, if you go out and make a, a pretty fair deal on a, on a ranch, be it, you know, 20 acres or 2,000 acres within, you know, depending on the size, it's an hour, hour and a half of Austin. You can't go wrong. I mean, if you're in it for, you know, a, a reasonably long amount of, you know, five years, that's, that's typically going to go up in value and you're going to do well. And the holding cost is absolute hardly. It's been on improvements, if it's minimal improvements, you know, improvements, uh, the ag is wildlife exemption, the holding cost is nothing. So, uh, when you got the use and the recreational, you know, it's not going to disappear in a puff of smoke like something you might have invested in the stock market or you're not earning one eighth of one percent in the bank. So, uh, I think land is like one of the best investments you can make. And particularly if you can buy land, and make a fair, you know, and and we're going out and previewing nearly 300 ranches a year. We're a little under that this year because we're so busy. We haven't been able to get out and preview as much. But I'd say, you know, two to 300 ranches a year, we go out and preview uh, that many ranches. So we're out there beating the bushes for really good deals on ranches. And good deals doesn't mean, hey, you're buying it right way below market. That just means, hey, this is a really nice ranch and it's priced right. But sometimes it is a really good deal. Like, not so much a distress sale as maybe just, you know, it wasn't priced right and, and it could be bought right. So <clears throat> if you can go identify and locate and make a, a reasonably good deal on a, on a piece of land that's within, you know, 60, 90 minutes of the fastest growing city and the fastest growing region in the country, that's going to go up in value. <clears throat> We're selling ranches now that we sold years ago that are now development tracks that the developers are buying. And these people have made really good money because now they're in the path of development. So uh, we got deals now we're doing where we sold bigger ranches. They, they bought them at, you know, 2,500, 3,000 an acre and we're cutting up and selling them at double that, you know, in smaller acreage tracks. So that's, there, there's still opportunity out there to make, uh, decent deals on lands and ranches. So again, you know, we go north, south, east, and west when we pre preview. Mostly we're going, um, west, northwest, southwest, because that's where most, a lot of people want to be. That's kind of the more desirable area, but it's also more expensive per acre going due west from Austin because that's the hill country. You know, that's got kind of the, the, the sizzle right now, if you will. But there's some beautiful land east, really pretty, and even that's obviously going up in value. But uh, Austin's fortunate; we got beautiful land in every direction. Well, how Just far is it go? You know, typically, I mean, we've gone, uh, 
we've gone all the way out to South and West Texas, but typically we stay busy enough within uh, a couple of hours, but we've listed ranches uh, four hours away. It's just got to make sense. And, uh, but typically within uh, two hours, you know, is where we list and sell ranches. Um, and we've been very successful at that. We're TexanLand.com, which is our company, is, is growing and we're expanding. And we, uh, we made a recent move to KW, uh, Kettle Williams specifically to grow, uh, all over Texas. And then, and then Texas, People got to realize 40% of all the ranches sold in the U.S. are sold in Texas. And so if you own Texas, man, you got the market. So, and there's some really good ranch brokerage companies in, in uh, Texas, but they're regional. You know, you got people that just focus on South Texas or they're West Texas. And anybody that knows Texas is, uh, you know, it takes just from Austin to El Paso is further than it is from El Paso to L.A. And think of that. And Austin's close to the center of the state. So people, I mean, so West Texas is like, feels like another place. You're right. It's it, it like when, you, when you're in Austin, you don't even think of El Paso as, as I mean, it's so far away. It's a 10-hour drive. So, <laughs> so it's right. pretty far. So, you know, that's a whole other market. South Texas is another market. Uh, east and North and Panhandle. I mean, it's a whole so, Far, but but so you don't have any one state. You got really good uh, ranch brokerage companies that are doing really well in their little region. So we think we're in a position to, with the move to KW and a partnership that we uh, now have with Gary Keller, uh, that we think we're in a position to take it statewide. So that our goal is to go statewide with ranches, whereas DMTX is more focused right here in in Central Texas, more locally based and greater often. And that's, that's, so that's, that's what we're doing. So when I say we do a lot of different things, a lot of different areas, uh, um, you know, we're even going beyond that. We're trying to go statewide. How many people in your group? You know, we got a dozen right now. Um, <clears throat> we, we've, we've got full time marketing, full time, um, uh, listing and, and contract to close and a full-time manager and then another person that's full-time that kind of helps in all these different areas. Then we've got uh, seven agents. <coughs> so, excuse me. <coughs> the move that we made to KW was just a few months ago. And, and so we're literally still laying the foundation. So we've literally had agents coming to us that want to join up and we're just not ready yet. I mean, we're just now getting ready. We're, um, we got to lay the foundation, right? You don't want to build a house on a without a solid foundation. We don't want to build a company without a solid foundation. So we're really, truly getting all the pieces in place to grow the company significantly. But when people come in uh, and join join us, we want to have everything clicking on all cylinders to just really make it a very smooth transition. So the agent. Uh, that are coming on board are very well qualified to be, you know, part of the team. And we're setting up uh, the system for them to be successful. We don't, you know, we don't want to just throw them into, you know, you know, something that's not running efficiently, smoothly, and, and at 100%. So that's where we're getting. That's where we're nearly there, not quite there. We've had a couple of agents that we've brought on board, but they're, they're, uh, they got in a little early because we didn't want to miss an opportunity. They're very good, uh, a very good fit for what we're doing. So, uh, that's where we're at and that's what we do. Cool. Uh, do you get much pushback about, uh, the property taxes? You had mentioned ag exemption and wildlife <clears throat> exemptions, which are invaluable uh, because of the property tax. Uh, how much pushback do you get on that? Well, think about it. You could buy a ten million dollar ranch if there's no improvements on your tax would be about a thousand bucks a year. It's it's like so, you know, you're going to get taxed on the improvements carved out on an acre at regular tax rate, so that's not going to be in a city. That's going to be school and county and probably be in the one 
point eight to two percent. Uh, but ag exempt puts it at a you know buck an acre or so. So I mean, the taxes are nothing if you got ag and wildlife with minimal to no improvements. Now, in pound, you know, obviously the tax rate could be higher, two point three to up to three. Uh, but you know, again, uh, it, if you're looking for quality schools, we don't. It, yes, the ta- property taxes are high if you. Um, you can, you're going to have a homestead exemption. If you're older, you might have the over 65 exemption. That's going to bring it down considerably. Uh, but let's say you're, all you have is homestead exemption and come from a state, uh, that has state income taxes. The problem, the state income tax that you do not have here far outweighs the, uh, you know, the, the, the like the school tax. That you pay here, and if you got kids that want quality schools, and you're not having to put them in private schools, and you don't have a state income tax, so that's that's normally an argument we can win. Uh, but the one thing I don't like is the you know the assessment they do every year, uh, and and they go up on your assessment every year. So and sometimes you got to go fight that uh, that tax assessment. So every year, year. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do. So I had this, a question that um, I was kind of curious about, and, you, and you've since you deal with both types of property, the ranches, and you said you also deal with some residential stuff. The market right now, what's the situation like if somebody's going in uh, to buy something, and you can compare it in either in both sides? Uh, what advice would you give them if it's like, hey, I like this place? What do they need to? What kind of position do they need to be in? What to just to be knowledgeable or to negotiate or? Well, you say they they decide that this is the place for them and they want to make an offer. I mean, you know, we've we've all heard well, the stories look at for a lot years of about. You got to the one. I mean, it's pretty quick and easy on a residential property. Look, this is how I compare properties. So we do a lot of unique properties, so they're not always so easy to like you know. Uh, Go and it, we can put a, a value on it, but it's not as easy as say what I call the cookie cutter neighborhood. And that could be a, a neighborhood that I say, well, every fifth house is the same. So that's easy, you know, and then there's some, and that could be a three to four to five hundred thousand dollar range, but it could be a, you know, in Westlake or Lake Travis or another area where, where the average price is considerably higher, but they're still easy, comparable. So one, you want to do comparables and you want to make sure it's price right uh, for them. And then beyond that, everybody we work with is pre-approved and we don't work with anyone that's not, uh, you know, either shows proof of funds for a cash purchase or they are, obviously if you can Google them and you pull them up and they're a high net worth individual, you're not going to ask Michael Dell to prove he's got the money, right? Uh-huh. Uh, so, but, but point being, they got to be ready to pull the trigger, you know, meaning they've already talked to a lender if they're getting along or they got proof of funds, cash, and you got to be prepared to show that when you make the offer because no seller is going to accept an offer without knowing that they, uh, they have a qualified buyer on the other end. So, so the buyer needs to take care of that. Uh, number one, and then they got to have a knowledgeable agent. Uh, on the market to know that they're, you know, they're getting a fair price. And, you know, some of these homes in these neighborhoods are going, uh, you know, within uh, days or weeks, uh, certainly within 30, 45 days, if they're priced right. So uh, some sometimes multiple offers. Uh, so, you know, they just got to be prepared and really laser focused on where they want to be. Yeah, and hopefully if they've got a good agent or they've done their homework, they look, it doesn't, this is what I used to say. It doesn't take a buyer long to try to, if they're, if they, I think a buyer can pretty quickly, if they go look at, you know, 10, 12 homes over a day or two, they can pretty quickly assess as long as they're, if, say, if they're in one market. So they say, hey, we want to be in Westlake. And man, they look at 10 or 12 homes. They're going to pretty quickly get an idea that along with an agent that, you know, qualified and 
you know, familiar with the market, they're going to be able to determine pretty quick what's a fair price, you know, based on the location and the, the home itself, the condition of the home, et cetera. So uh, I think buyers can educate themselves pretty quickly on, on what they, what's the, you walk in one home and say, you know, this is a nice home, but it's overpriced. Another one is in, in, in great, con- it, not in good condition, but it's priced accordingly. So it just, I don't think it, it, you can, between an agent and a buyer that's done their homework, you can definitely uh, quickly assess uh, the value of the home. And, and then you can go back that up with, you know, with comparables. Now, I would tell you this right now, probably, I wouldn't say half, but a large percentage of the deals we've done this year have never hit the market. We, they've right. never hit multiple listing service. We sell them before they go on the market. We sell them privately off the market. And that doesn't mean they're flying off the shelf. That just means we have a lot of sellers that don't want to put them on the market publicly. Right. No, that was that was kind of where I was going with the question was, um, you know, a lot of people may not be used to a market like this where they're coming from, where, you know, things hit the hit the listing and they're gone the next day, you know, or yeah, some things that's never hit so it. I mean, it depends. That's, that's more the median price range and in, in select areas where maybe they're selling really, really quick. I mean, there's still a lot of availability of, of properties at a reasonable price, and they're not all flying off the shelf. And that's what I tell people. There's people that want retail, and, and, and if they're different, unique, retail is going to take, it could take a while. You know, and there's people that come to me and say, look, I'm, I'm ready to sell this and I want you to price it accordingly to sell it in 30 or 60 days. You know, it's just a different market. And if you're, if you're, say, in a neighborhood that's really popular and it's the medium price range, you can price that home where you almost certainly can sell it within, you know, 30 to 45 days. Okay. The median price range being in Austin right now between three and four hundred thousand. So popular neighborhood, median price range, home that shows well, uh, should sell within a short time. But that doesn't mean it's going to fall off the shelf. You know that, it, but within thirty to forty-five days to be expected. Right. So sooner. I know you it could had... sell. It could sell within a few days or sooner, but typically thirty to forty-five days. And they're not so short on inventory that they're just like. You know, listed the next day it's gone. Now there was, uh, like there used to be, in, in that what used to be one of the most popular zip codes in Austin was that area southwest of, uh, west of Mopac, south of William Cannon, uh, where the homes were, were literally multiple offers. And literally the agent would say, they would list on Thursday and they'd say all offers will be responded to Monday at 6 p.m open house all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and there would be people lining up to go in, and they would have seven, six, seven, eight, nine, ten offers to choose from. Now, that was crazy. I'm not seeing that. Right. So I knew you had a... Um... And they would go, they would literally go for a $400,000 home, like the winning bid might end up being 430000 and the agents that knew well enough would have a clause in there the selling agent would have a clause in there that said um, this sale cannot be terminated due to uh, appraisal not meeting value. So wow. in other words, that did not, and that the buyer would have to make up the difference, uh, you know, with more cash. Right. So I know you had a, a, a commitment uh, in just a few minutes. So there's a couple of questions we thought we, we posed to you before we uh, let you uh, get to your stuff. So you've lived here since the mid eighties. Uh, what's, what do you think there are the biggest changes other than traffic that you've seen here? Hey, the traffic's not so bad right now with the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, I mean, honestly, right. I'm, my office, my office is uh, on West six, literally a block east of Mopac on the edge of downtown. And if you didn't leave here at a certain time, you would be just, you know, you'd be way back up. Now I pull out. Boom. And I'm not here that often, but, you know, my, my staff would say, oh, my God, we got to leave here at 3.30, you know, to get, to, you know, it, it'd be a difference getting home in 30 minutes or an hour, 
you know, and now it's like, no worries, man. You get get through with one 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 traffic light, you know, it's where it just takes like three or four to get through to one traffic light, you know, three or four different light changes. So, but I would say, uh, you know, traffic obviously uh, has been impacted because Austin's never been very good about keeping up with that. I think back in the 80s, and even early nineties that that they're literally their their idea of people running the city was uh well if we don't build the roads people won't come. Well that didn't work out too well. Uh, yep, yep. but but you know <laughs> so they they've done, you know, one A three A and the one hundred thirty and the tollways have helped and forty five and so they've done some but for a big city I think there's still uh, some catch up to do. But, I, you know, the skyline significantly has changed. The traffic has, has uh, obviously uh, caused uh, some issues with commute times. Uh, I mean, I still think Austin's got so much of its natural beauty still, but with Lady Bird Lake and Pike Bike Trail and the Bart Creek Green Belt and Silker Park and Barton Springs and, and Lake Travis and Lake Austin, I mean, some of that still make you know still feels like Austin you can and Austin is unique in the sense that you got so much outdoor living and so much natural beauty right in the middle of town right I mean literally right in the center of town you got so much unlike some some bigger cities so and that's not going to change and another thing going out the hill country you still because so many of the ranch big ranches uh, thankfully have put their land in conservation easements meaning they can never be developed. And so you still have these in Austin and, and Travis County, along with some federal assistance and some, to some degree, have done a really good job of buying tens of thousands of acres in the surrounding hill country and putting that in, in, in conservation land that can never, ever be developed. So forever, you know, hopefully forever is probably not the right term, but... Uh, for a very long time, none of that land will ever be developed, and hopefully never. But you know, so that really preserves a lot. Of, and some of these, give, give them credit. I mean, there's some big ranches that were thousands of acres that would have been worth tens of millions of dollars to a developer that had been put in conservation that will never ever be developed. You know, so that you still have that going west, and uh, so that's that saved a lot of our hill country land. Yeah. So since Austin likes to pride itself on keep Austin weird, what's the weirdest thing you've seen in Austin? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I see it every day. It's, you know, but, uh, you know, there used to be Leslie that stood on the street corners, which was, you know, the drag queen that would be out on the corner right. and, and sharp, little hot pants and high heels and I mean there's all kinds of things I mean I, I still love to go down to, if you want to see keep Austin weird go down to uh, Barton Springs where the water flows out and that's what I call the, there's the side you can pay in to go into Barton Springs and go hang out at the at where it flows out into Barton Street before it flows into Lady Bird Lake, which used to be Town Lake. And uh, you go down there on a nice, beautiful, sunny, warm day, particularly on the weekend, and you'll see uh, hundreds of people and probably 50 to 100 dogs and kayaks and canoes and tubes and and a lot of different people, a lot of different people. <laughs> that to me. And I still love going down there. I mean, I just love going down there, walking, running, hiking jumping in that cold water at 68 degrees year round and uh and just and just sitting back and like kind of like checking it all out because that to me is uh it's it's more people but it's still like old you know kind of still like old also it used to be used to be when we came up here in high school it used to be back in, in the uh late 70s and be go out to hippie hollow right and hippie hollow was the nudist areas and uh, there were other places on Lake Travis too. Paceman Park had one and then Hippie mm-hmm. Hollow's the famous one. And that uh that was obviously in high school when we used to come up here in the late seventies, that was 
like part of the magic <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> it's a little different now it's, uh, it's more an alternative lifestyle than it is and so not as not as popular for me personally to visit but it's uh you know just things like that i mean it's it's different but it also now you've got more of a big city uh feel and you see that unfortunately in the homeless and uh, you know some of the other things that are, are not as not as weird as just uh you know sad <laughs> i guess yeah that's well said <laughs> so the um the last one and joel i feel like this is the first person i don't have to put conditions on you know is <laughs> if you're planning on moving to austin and we normally po- say what advice would you give somebody who's planning on moving to austin other than don't and we don't have to do the don't for dave i believe <laughs> So no, no, that's... I mean, you know, it depends why they're moving them. But again, I mean, look, it's a great place. To, uh, again, I've relocated so many people. Now, I'm not one of those that's like, hey, don't come to Austin. Just hopefully, you know, if, if there was a donor there, I would say don't bring uh, politics with you that made you want to leave California, Chicago, New York. So that would be my don't. But I'd, I'd say, you know, come on. Come on and just, you know, know what you want when you get here and hook up with a good agent. I don't know what, it, just so many people are looking for different things, but I, I, I try to be very positive and promote everything positive and good about Austin because I think there's so much to share with people, be they moving here to, to relocate with a business or start a business or they just want a quality of life. I just think there's so many different uh, options and, and so many different areas and so many different price ranges, uh, you know, be it they're downtown or they want to live in the suburbs. And, and, and I always joke, I'm South Austin boy because that feels more like old Austin day as opposed to going north. I said, if you want to feel like you're living in, in Dallas, go up north, go to Cedar Park, Round Rock, and all that, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is really nice, but it just doesn't feel, it doesn't have the, quite the same vibe as, as like, you know, West Central and South Austin. So it really, truly, it just depends what you're looking for. But obviously, uh, it still amazes me when I talk to people that have lived here for a long, long time and they haven't been to Lake Travis yet, which is like one of the most beautiful lakes in all of all of the U.S., but certainly without comparison to any other lake. I, again, I'm biased, but any other lake in uh, Texas and probably most of the southern U.S. So it's absolutely one of the, And Lake Austin, I mean, you just... Yeah, it's so much natural beauty here. It's uh, hard not to be positive about people that want to move here and relocate here for whatever reason. Right. Well, with that, we're going to let you uh, get out of here, but I would first like you to plug your uh, real estate agency and your websites. Hell, I've been doing that the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> Always be closed. Look. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. I'm with Keller Williams, uh, and uh, so my plug quick quick with Keller Williams, biggest real estate company in the world, most technology, and, and one of the top companies. And I didn't know all this. And I, you know, I'm homegrown in Austin, and it's the largest real estate start in Austin, largest real estate company in the world. And they they have that they're rated number one in the world for education, not just in real estate, but in business in general. And Gary Keller, who heads it up, is ranked top three every year for one of the most influential people in real estate in the world. And and he's here, starting in Austin. So TexasLand.com is ours. We don't ask me. It's, I'm still amazed that we got that domain because we we got that a couple of years ago. TexasLand.com, which we think is the best uh, name for a land and ranch. We also own TexasRanch.com and a bunch of about a hundred other names. But TexasLand.com is the uh, land and ranch. DMTX uh, is the other dot dot com. DMTX.com, TexasLand.com. And it's DMTX Realty Group uh, under KW Keller Williams. So we're we're incredibly fortunate to be in Austin and Central Texas and and in Texas in general. I know I'm I'm a proud born and raised Texan. I, I ventured away from Texas for a while, but I found my way back. Oh, great! I'm glad you did. Dave, we sure appreciate your time. 
Yeah. Hey, I, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Anytime. Uh, all right. Well, fantastic. Joel, Dave, and myself, we'll see you next time on the trail to Austin. Thanks a lot. Bye. Great.